I want to go into your past yeah. and you know and your book and who you were in a you know in the previous life and who you are now and why you're recognizing this and you're so fiercely resisting this shit more than a lot of people are because a lot of people are scared of blowback like they see what's going on with governments mm -hmm. and with lockdowns and all these things and they're they're scared of the blowback and so they're kind of keeping their mouth shut but you're not doing that at all and I think a lot of that has to do with your past. I've seen less, yeah. So will, will you just give us a, a, like a rundown sure. of what happened with you? So I, um, for your listeners, I was born in Essex, UK, and um, had a very normal, integrated childhood until I kind of hit my teenage years. Um, and from my teenage years, we were the first generation, by the way, of um, Muslims born and raised in the West. My parents were immigrants, and why that re why that's relevant is we, uh, my age group now, I'm 44, we had to navigate a place for Muslims in the West. Prior to that point, of course, um, that hadn't been done, and there's a long history with uh, sort of this whole Huntington model of a clash of civilizations, which is a bit caricature, but there's a long history sort of between Islam and the West and, and relations and, and mixing. Some of it's good, a lot of it involved war with the Crusades. So we are now born and raised in the West as British citizens. Now, to put that into context in Europe, if you look with the US and you have minority communities, a lot of the um, room for improvement exists in say African-American communities, right? In Europe, the equivalent is with Muslim communities, wherever you go, whether it's in Britain with Pakistanis and Bangladeshis, whether it's in France with the North Africans, in Morocco, uh, uh, in the Netherlands with North Africans, Moroccans, in Germany with Turks, uh, across Europe generally, Albanians who also majority happen to be Muslim, but more cultural, not really that religious. But across Europe, the, 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 the largest minorities are Muslims. And so that same question about uh, integration, uh, cooperation, um, equal opportunities, social uh, mobility. Whereas in the US it applies specifically, I don't know, say for example with African Americans and Mexican Americans or Latino Americans in, the, in, the, in Europe generally and in the UK, it's a Muslim question. So when I began, sort of hit my teenage years, we experienced a lot of tension around that. And uh, there was a lot of racist violence that I experienced growing up with some sort of neo-Nazi racist violence. And when I say violence, I'm talking um, severe, severe shit, like machete and hammer attacks, screwdriver attacks. I've had to watch friends of mine get stabbed before the age of 16. Many of my friends stabbed. Uh, we had running street fights with these guys, knives, machetes, everything. I mean, this is like, a, it was really bad. Um, one particular occasion, this guy tried to help me. I was surrounded by a group of them, and uh, they all had their big kebab knives. Um, I thought I was going to die, man. And then this, this guy was just walking past, random guy walking past. He saw that I was surrounded by these guys and he tried to step in to defend me. And what they did is they, I was 15 years old. They held me back and they basically started stabbing this guy all over his body, forced me to watch it. And they called him a packy lover. Oh, Jesus. And the idea was that he's a traitor to his skin for trying to defend me. Um, so of course I became very angry. Yeah. Uh, but by the way, I, I met that guy uh, about he two lived. years ago. He lived, he had a punctured lung. <sighs> Turns out he was with the army. He's a hero for me, man. He's a hero. And uh, I put out a public appeal to see if I could get uh, reunited with him. He wants to stay anonymous, but I met him. And he's still alive and he still, still lives in, the, in my hometown. He's still you know, local wow. to the area in my home county. But that made me very angry. At the same time, if you want to think back, the time frame we're talking about, the early 90s, uh, the genocide in Bosnia was happening. And the Bosnians are also Muslim. And so we, we felt that uh, that could come to Britain. We felt very isolated. We felt very... Uh, uh, very vulnerable and so we were looking in that context for some form of belonging feeling rejected from those from society around us uh, the guys that the guys that attacked us by the way they would boast about having connections and links with the police and uh, it turns out to be the case that, that there was uh, a problem in those days with the police There's a famous case of uh, the murder of Stephen Lawrence in the UK who was uh, stabbed to death in a similar way while waiting at a bus stop and his killers were never brought to justice for over 20 years and um, there was a government inquiry commissioned into that. It's called the McPherson Inquiry. And it eventually became famous for coining that phrase, institutional racism. And it was talking about how police were not looking into these sorts of crimes. So nobody was ever brought to justice for what happened to us. And 
Everything I described was a year before Stephen Lawrence was murdered, but that became the pivotal case in the UK. It became like a George Floyd moment because it was huge, except he wasn't, you know, I know George Floyd had some background. This guy had, he was clean. He was just a, a young kid, no background. He was just at a bus stop. So in that context, we became very angry and we became, uh, began looking for belonging and identity outside of the mainstream that we felt rejected us. And so at the age of 16, why that's all relevant is um, I ended up joining a, a, a revolutionary Islamist organization. Uh, I didn't trust society. I didn't trust authority. I didn't trust the West generally. Uh, looking at the genocide in Bosnia with the UN troops, one of the, uh, the most searing memories for me was at Srebrenica where the, UN, the Dutch UN uh, soldiers were standing by as, as the Bosnian Muslims were killed and put in that mass grave and they didn't have the mandate to intervene. So we really didn't trust institutions to defend us, whether it was foreign policy or even domestic at home. So at the age of 16, I joined this group called Hezb tahrir which means the Party of Liberation. And uh, it's, it, in a nutshell, the before Al-Qaeda and definitely before ISIS, this was an organization that wanted a caliphate globally around the world. But instead of using terrorism in the conventional means we understand it today, blowing things up, our purpose, our method, was to recruit army officers in Muslim-majority countries and instigate military coups to try and come to power. I joined this group at 16, and I spent um, about a decade, uh, well, yeah, more, just over a decade in this organization. I rose to the leadership in the UK. I set the group, I exported it from the UK and set it up in uh, Pakistan. I was part of the first move in the wave that went from Britain to Pakistan to found the group there. In that, in that vein, I ended up recruiting some army officers there in Pakistan as well. Can I ask you how that happens? How do you, how do you make contact with the army officers and how could you recruit them? And like, how would you go yeah. about doing that? Well, there's this uh, military academy in the UK that globally countries send their uh, officers to for training. It's called Sandhurst. And uh, we would, because of the Pakistani community, we knew friends who had relatives or whatever that would be coming from Pakistan to study at Sandhurst. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, like an officer's training academy. And then